very much uh, for the invitation, having us here. Um, it's good and we really much uh, appreciate the opportunity um, to share some, um, let's say, conceptual ideas <coughs> of something which is very much uh, work in progress, you can say. So um, we would like to share these ideas and uh, hopefully have a, uh, a lively discussion in the end um, with you on what we are planning to do. So, um, contested constructions of wildlife in Namibian conservation practices, a conceptual framework, that is uh, what we would like to present. And uh, this is the structure of what we are going to present. So, after um, not really short, but a bit broader introduction into uh, the topic, uh, we will give you uh, some ideas of this uh, conceptual framework of wildlife, which we are going to employ. Um, then there will be uh, some um, background on information on what we call our political ecology perspective on this matter. And then on the other side, uh, and afterwards, pretty much integrated um, a perspective of visual geographies that we also would like to employ. And that will be uh, the conclusion in the end, like having these two strands together um, and uh, presenting a conceptual framework on Namibia's future wildlife that embraces these two perspectives. And to start with, I would like just to present you some mm. examples about struggles of conceptions of nature and wildlife with one first quote from a, a manager of the Ministry of Environment and, and Tourism. And I will just read it now in German, in, in English for the non-German speakers of you. But you cannot compare a springbok with a rhino. If we have too many springboks in a small park, we decide what is more valuable. Should we catch them and shove them into another park? Say these other parks also have too many. Should we shoot them? Should we sell them alive? How much does it cost to catch them alive and sell them? You need to consider and then to make a decision. And I think one of the key words here is, is, here is value. And here you have a, a struggle between different values, values of, for conservation, the value of the animals for conservation, and the value in monetary terms, there's a cost benefit analysis done here. How much does it cost to shoot them? How much does it cost to, to, to catch them and to put them in another part? So there are struggles here in, in one person. But of course, you can imagine, very well imagine, that inside the Ministry of Environment and Tourism, there are different strands. There are people who are really looking more at the costs and people who are more in favor of nature conservation for the interest of conservation. Another example, I don't know if you came across this story um, two or three years ago where a wealthy American citizen bought by, by an auction at the Dallas um, Safari Club um, the, right, the right to shoot a black rhino. A black rhino is quite rare and there were only two put in auction um, that year um, in the, um, the Palmberg concession and there was of, of course a, an upheaval especially from from uh, in the US um, for shooting this individual animal and here there were a campaign from opponents um, who wanted to pressurize the um, US Fish and Wildlife Service to deny to import the trophy uh, uh, and making then the shooting worthless um, for this um, Mr. Knowlton and here there's also a reminiscence in, on, this, on this collage. Africans go to jail for poaching. White men go home with a trophy. And here there's also a legacy which is part of this struggle um, between the different interests um, confronted in conservation debates. Now I will <coughs> continue with the importance of media and images in this conservation approaches and the struggles over conservation. And here I'm, we are taking a, a quote from Daniel Brockington from the University of Manchester, 
who is emphasizing the importance of the media and the images. And here, I think what, what is important to remember is that um, what we could call the spectacle of nature. And he is here mobilizing authors like um, Baudrillard and <laughs> Guy Debord. Um, is fast becoming one of the important ways in which capitalism and conservation um, are interacting and even cooperating. And I think for a long time, at least in my youth, um, there was a kind of antagonism between capitalism on one side and nature and nature conservation on the other side, saying, okay, capitalism is destroying <coughs> nature, is destroying our environment, and now we are now part of a discourse where both are not at all opponents anymore, but are somehow completely imbricated. And one question is, of course, how and why? With, with what logic? So what we are now intend, what we intend um, to do is to understand this multidimensional interplay of practices of different actors who are um, stakeholders in this conservation um, debate and these practices which are decisive um, for the conservation and then of what kind of nature, what kind of wildlife. Um, then of course it also includes the imaginations which are at play here and I think all pe every, everyone has some pictures, some Im imaginaries um, in mind when talking about nature, wildlife, and nature conservation. <coughs> and of course, what we intend to do is to excavate these imageries of nature conservation in order to understand the practices which are following um, these um, imageries. So our focus is at, at the interface between, on one side, political ecology of nature conservation, on the other side, um, the visual geography in order to understand this decision-making processes which are uh, producing this what kind of nature or what kind of, of wildlife. So I think most of you are very familiar with political ecology, so I don't want to repeat and, and read everything here on the slide. What I think is m the most important aspect here is that the relationships of power which are inherent, inherent to processes um, of economic transformations are also a result of this um, capitalist relations of production on one side. And then I think in German we have a very nice concept of Vergesellschaftung which also goes back to, to Marx, <coughs> meaning the appropriation of nature is depending on a dialectical relationship between on one side the conception and the transformation of nature. On, on one side, the ideas we have of nature and the use we have and we are making out of nature. So as it comes uh, to the visual geography perspective on that, um, we can say that these struggles upon uh, Namibia's future wildlife are very much uh, affected by um, what we can name the visual imaginary and its effect. And we think that visual geography in this respect um, provides a very good opportunity for reflecting on this interrelation of mental as well as material images that come together in these uh, discursive as well as um, um, uh, discourses as well as uh, views that we have if you, if you normally look at landscape and how we imagine landscape and how we imagine it should be and what should be part of it and what not. So this is a very uh, basic approach of uh, the visual geography side. And um, on the other hand, uh, we would like to position us a little bit uh, in the recent discourse on non-representational and re Presentational theory, and we think that the, this kind of approach is, of course, in a way representational. Um, as we work with uh, images, with pictures, material images, um, mental images, um, and how they have an effect. But on the other hand, it is also non-representative. 
uh, representational. And so far, um, as this supposed representational, we think, has an effect and we critically reflect on this effect and how it is always um, dividing, for example, uh, between something that is natural and something that is non-natural, the human and the non-human, and so on. We will proceed on that later on. So, <clears throat> this will also give us um, a good chance uh, to look closer at the um, power relation within this field and also the power of images and how they work. Um, on the other hand, we will also take into account the effective immediate effect of visuality and its somatic power. So this is also a non-representational um, aspect of what we are planning to do and of what uh, visual geography can serve with. So there is something that can get you very physically if you look at a picture, and uh, which can not only be grasped if you see it as a representational act. And uh, as we will see later on, these uh, images uh, might, theoretically spoken, also have an effect, effect on what we do and how wildlife in itself is being materialized by what we think it should be. Um, and the final point of, uh, of the opportunities of a visual geography approach is that we can also critically deal with the historicity and the discursivity of images and inherent interpretive power structures. And on this point, we will also proceed uh, later on. Additionally, or maybe also as a uh, against the background of uh, what we presented so far, we can also say that what we would like to do is a uh, post-colonial and social nature perspective. Post-colonial, as it is presupposing and critically questioning dominant colonial Eurocentric or Western imaginations of white life. Mm. And what is important uh, is <coughs> that this is not uh, dedicated to specific subjects. So it can be, it's never like uh, black and white. It's not, never precise persons that are carrying the one perspective or the other. Mm -hmm. And finally, it's also social nature in the way that we are presupposing uh, the social construction of nature, but without reducing the natural to um, its social construction. So as I said, there is more than that, and uh, we will try to grasp um, like agency on the one hand, uh, agency even of uh, animals, uh, and on the other hand also the uh, visual somatic power of uh, of what is depicted as, for example, wildlife. As a continuation of our positionality in the uh, theoretic uh, debate and uh, discourses, we would also like to stress that uh, we are not going to adopt uh, without any critical reflection what, for example, Lorimer um, claims to be a new ontology of wildlife because uh, we, uh, we don't think that it is so easy just to claim that uh, these dualisms of uh, nature and culture, um, uh, the material, the non-material, and so forth, um, can be easily overcome. They cannot easily be overcome, especially not uh, by claiming it to be it like that, because they are... Um, every day made and reproduced. And this is why we think it's much more worthwhile to um, employ what we um, call a epistemological anthropocentrism. So we very much um, position ourselves as being anthropocentric 
and uh, that we are not able to get out of this position easily. Uh, so what we think is interesting then is to follow the dualisms, not to claim them to be overcome, but to see how they are employed in everyday life, in discourses and the imaginary of wildlife and nature. And on the other hand, then we have also a possibility to look at their realities because they are real in a way that uh, they are made and their shifts. So our concept of wildlife and its other, so it's, it's also a dualism, is uh, wildlife for us is the product of a process in which representational and material practices as well as hum non-human agency are entangled. So this is the field. And that it is uh, temporarily and territorially defined and fixed by humans. That it is made stable and static and essential in everyday language, in everyday visualization, in everyday practice. But on the other hand, ontologically spoken, we outgo from that it is dynamic and variable by nature. Then we have the chance to look um, at, uh, in, uh, at the material and physical resonances and resistances that are included in this process. So um, we have this construction of nature we have this construction of wildlife and construction of what is in and what is out and uh, of uh, exclusions and inclusions. But on the other hand, we also sus suspect the material, at least the material, uh, the, the, like the animals, uh, to be resonant, that there are resistances, that there's, it, it's not easy to, to, to just construct it like that and then it is like that. So, um, we will see this later on in some ex examples. And uh, finally, we also suspect that there is something like a visual uh, encounter that also have, uh, has uh, like a blending of uh, physical, material, and um, representational effects. One example for this is uh, the charisma of uh, animals that makes a difference if you um, do some kind of construction of uh, who should be loved, who should be in, who should be part of our future nature, who should be part of our future wildlife. Uh, then it uh, makes a difference if you have a, a lion or um, like a killer. <laughs> something creepy or not, not very charismatic. Mm -hmm. Okay, <clears throat> I wanted to present you, even the slide is not excellent, but there's a, a debate going on in, in park research, trying to understand um, the different periods of um, park and establishment of, of parks and the purpose of these parks. And um, one very famous um, article from Mays, a biologist published in Science, um, differentiated among three or four different periods of the establishment of parks. I don't want to go too much into details, but the, the first generation parks, the one uh, of, <coughs> for example, of um, Yellowstone or, or the Swiss National Park, um, that were created nature for itself. Uh, it was really a biological, uh, um, a natural, um, naturist uh, approach. Then there was nature despite people. This is the phase where a lot of people got expelled um, from different parks, especially in Africa, in Africa, but also in South America. And then with the beginning of the 2000s um, and the, the <coughs> increasing resistance also on the global scale to the expel of, of these people, um, a new approach was um, 
implemented also thanks to donor agencies, Nature for People, with this whole debate of ecosystem services, etc. And on the and now we have people and nature, um, an approach, a paradigm which is trying to emphasize the core co um, habitant, the possibility of coexistence of um, nature and people in these parks. Now there <coughs> a political ecology um, perspective would say, okay, that's fine and nice, um, but which, what is missing here is really the economic, uh, the political economy, which are lying behind these paradigms and the approaches. And um, Vakao and colleagues um, framed the concept of fortress conservation. This is what is, um, Mace is, is calling nature for itself, which need to be protected from any kind of influence coming from outside. That's why big fences or walls in order to protect nature from any kind of, <coughs> of influence. And what we have now with these ecosystem services and um, this approach people and nature, this is what uh, they call co-management conservation, um, trying really to, to, <coughs> to find a consensus uh, between different interests which are um, at stake and or neoliberal um, conservation. And this is the whole um, movement of how now more and more services which were belonging to uh, park administrations were um, outsourced, privatized, um, delegated to other um, NGOs or, or companies. Well, only as a remark, though it is chronologically depicted here, uh, Mace herself says, of course, that uh, all, of, uh, all of these uh, four key ideas can be found uh, parallel and uh, in, in book today. So um, you have to look very closely on, this, on the certain groups that are employing um, these, uh, partic the one particular idea, key idea of nature conservation. An excellent example of this is uh, this kind of map, where you have this um, national parks in dark green. Um, this is the state protected areas like the Etosha National Park, the Namib Naukluft, um, <coughs> Skeleton Coast Park. And then you have the, <coughs> the um, um, concession areas like, for example, Palmberg. This is um, C2 here in the northwestern corner. What are, or Hobatere uh, C4, just adjacent to the, um, to the um, Etosha National Park. And then, of course, the whole big list um, of communal conservancies, which spread um, from roughly the western part of, of um, Namibia to also other parts of Namibia. And something which also now started heavily to, to grow uh, since the 90s, are the freehold uh, conservancies. These are farms, cattle farms, which were converted um, to um, game farms. Some are consolidated, meaning that farms are added one by one to create a, a big um, cons um, conservancy, freehold conservancy, uh, which are run uh, according to different um, institutions, either private companies, multinationals, um, or foundations. So, and here on this map, you have the, the coexistence of different approaches of nature conservation. We have on one side still the approach of fortress conservation in these national parks. You have um, this neoliberal momentum in the freehold, but even in the communal um, conservancies, uh, very present, and of course in the concession. So now, interesting for us is to see how do they relate um, to each other? Who is influencing what? What kind of concepts are taken over? What are rejected? What are the kind of relationships established uh, of these different entities? <coughs> and here, perhaps, just to summarize um, the um, kind of thesis you can formulate um, with these um, different approaches of nature conservation and, and wildlife. Um, you have, of course, this privatization of public spaces. And I think for the ones who know Etosha uh, National Park since many years can already observe how 
um, the certain services are now outsourced, are delegated to private companies um, through licensing or different concessions. <coughs> There's a, a shift from recreational purpose of national parks to commercialization. I mean, you can already um, compare the prices of entrance of, of the Atosha National Park um, since its beginnings to today. Um, I mean, at the very beginning, it was a national park for whites only during the apartheid region for recreation in order to support somehow the political basis of the apartheid regime to give them some, something to play with on one side. And today it's commercialized um, on such a level that even if it's cheaper for Namibian natives to, to enter, it's still a very, um, a, a park which is very much dominated by uh, white people. And then there's a shift um, in market orientation in the sense that because it was so cheap, because it was also part of the um, South African approach to nature, which was also trying to consolidate its political basis, it was des designed and accessible for the middle classes, even for the lower middle classes. And now through the prices, through the, um, the possibilities the prices of um, overnight stays um, in the parks, etc. It's more, it's more getting to become something um, reserved somehow for the upper class. And it is even more obvious if you are looking at the hunting um, um, sector, which, are <coughs> which is um, aiming at a very, very specific um, market segment. Um, and be it the sport hunting, um, the trophy hunting, and um, in Namibia also starting with the canned hunting. Just to illustrate the importance of hunting, now you can download uh, from the internet um, the demand for a permit for a hunting permit, and you can here, <coughs> you have the free choice between a cheetah, a leopard, or a lion. And to, <coughs> to, to finish with, Last point is uh, the role of protected species. Of course, once certain species have their price on the market, you can arrange, organize auctions either in Namibia or in the US. Um, then for the park managers, there is the question, do we breed now for the sake of conservation, um, for the biodiversity, biodiversity with the logic of, of biology, or do we breed for the market? And I think here already, and especially thinking about the um, um, Waterberg Plateau National Park, where some species are only located there, and it's not for disseminating this kind of species, uh, like the buffalo, to other parks in Namibia, but it's really for the market. And here auctions are now multiplying. Uh, in Namibia, it's just um, um, <coughs> something we, um, we encountered last year where we're when we were in, in Namibia, you can yeah, acquire whatever you desire from a, from a rhino um, to a sable antelopes. There's even a, a beginner packages if you want really to start. But we don't enter so much in communal conservancies. There are so many research going on um, on this topic. Um, there, there's also a debate about the purpose, the, the logic, the rationale of these communal uh, conservancies in, in relation with um, wildlife management. Of course, people are thinking and presenting it's again in, in terms of access to additional financial resources um, because of the tourism coming in, but it, it's a way out of the poverty uh, trap. And there's, of course, a starting and increasing the importance of shift from the uh, livestock farming um, to game farming because it's, it's much, um, much more gaining. Um, here, I don't want to, to go too much in the debate, but it's an interesting one um, in order to understand also the purpose um, of nature conservation in these conservancies. Of course, the conservancies, perhaps just to underline this, are not homogeneous. There are different people, the communities are quite um, socially um, differentiated, and of course, there are people there who are gaining out of this nature conservation business, and some are losing. 
And one of the, I think, most interesting and important relations um, that we can see from a visual geography perspective is that of um, how we come from images uh, to actions, um, how this is uh, transferred. So how our imagination and, uh, and their material implications, um, how can they be theorized, um, how can they be grasped. And uh, we call this um, the perlocution of the visual and of imagination. I take this term from speech act theory, actually. Um, so and the perlocutionary acts um, are viewed at the level of, its, uh, of their consequences. So um, how are they, how are images persuading, convincing, scaring maybe, enlightening, inspiring, or otherwise affecting the obser observer or the viewer? And uh, one of uh, the very uh, critical uh, terms here are expectations, because a visuality can't shape, uh, is, is, or powerfully shapes, uh, expectations, for example, of how, uh, of what we are going to see if we go there. Um, this you can also take from the picture that we already presented. So uh, there's ad 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 um, advertisement on Namibia um, from travel agency and seas and so on, and they depict. Um, Namibia in a particular way, and the nature uh, of Namibia in a particular way. Um, so, and this, on the other hand, then is uh, uh, shaping the expectations of, for example, travelers going, who go there and who would like to have uh, Namibia then exactly, more or less, as they saw uh, in the pictures. So, there are, there are both um, expectations of specific visual experience, and these are also invitations or motivations to go there, to travel there, which in turn also have uh, economic e effects, of course. So um, imaginary is a, a very important um, player in, in this uh, field. And not the least, such a visuality also has its effect on park management, of course. Because if park managers know what the expectations of um, like travelers, tourists, um, economic clients uh, are, uh, they use it, of course, as a guideline for how they, um, how you say, put or shift uh, animals in their parks or not, which is referring to the quote uh, from the uh, uh, park manager from the Ministry of uh, Education and Tourism that we presented in the beginning. So, and in this respect, you really can talk about that uh, wildlife is designed in a particular way that is uh, visually um, inflected. And this visuality of wildlife, um, of course, has a history, and this is also something that we are going to, um, to deal with, and uh, that we are going to uh, want to reconstruct to understand better um, how um, these uh, um, expectations and management practices to die are guided by uh, the visuality, not only of today, but also of the past. Um, and this will, of course, then will last into the future, as we suspect. Um, so, um, we outgo from uh, transethnic colonial, trans colonial heritage. Why transethnic? Because, as I said in the beginning, we are not uh, saying that, uh, that there's uh, one uh, imaginary that belongs to one particular um, um, ethnic group or something. Um, so that they today also interlap and that you can find a particular imaginary that you, you would uh, maybe uh, easily um, um, uh, cling to uh, a black uh, or a traditional or autochtone idea, uh, but it is not so. So it, it is really transgreeding, uh, as we suspect, uh, such, uh, such uh, uh, 
not dualism, but categories that we um, sometimes very easily put on that. Um, so, but, uh, you want to say something about the black poachers and white hunters, maybe? Okay. Um, And these uh, different imaginaries uh, can also um, vary um, if you only look at uh, one particular animal, for instance. So this is uh, like the uh, elephant example. So you have a kind of uh, uh, imaginary or a particular construction um, outgoing from here, the sun people, or the Oberhimba, and this is where, uh, what the quote is about. Um, for, for them, the Oberhimba, the elephant is accorded respect and his habits are well known. When used as an epithet for human beings, it is out of a sense of strength, wisdom, and stability. So we have, here we have the elephant as a strong, um, you can say, companion of the human. And another discourse strand, um, there's another elephant constructed. Here, the elephant is the intruder. Um, and uh, almost a criminal who is uh, trespassing uh, the borders and uh, the fences uh, that are aligned. Um, And here's uh, a third elephant coming up. Here, the elephant is a status, is a symbol for not it's his, his or her um, strength itself, but uh, for the strength of them who are hunting them, poaching them, whatever. So, no, hunting them in this uh, case, yes. Um, And here is a fourth elephant, and here the elephant is uh, um, a necessary part of the inventory of national parks uh, in Namibia and of Namibia itself. Or even, uh, as you say, see Africa. So. And that images are um, important in this respect and that uh, they need to be managed is uh, something that uh, also the um, public discourse and uh, even the ministry has uh, now um, taken into account. So here, this is a story about uh, a couple of lions that has been shot by um, uh, Namibian peasants. Uh, illegally, you must say, because in Namibia it's uh, uh, today like uh, that you uh, first, if you have a lion on, your, on lion on your compound, then you must report this lion to the ministry as a problem lion. And then the ministry decides whether this lion is to be shot or not, or whatever is said to be done with it. So, and they did not do that, but uh, uh, shot them um, instantly, and then they took pictures from it, and then they posted that on Facebook. And this was uh, a very uh, fueled, a big uh, debate on, uh, on properties, on uh, territorially uh, defined entitlement to wild animals, uh, wild animals, uh, wild animals. Um, and um, not the less, um, you can, uh, you can also see how this fueled the debate later on uh, on imaginaries uh, that uh, these people somehow destroyed um, and uh, that uh, then uh, led to imaginaries of Namibia without lions. Uh, that was also something that uh, was very negatively um, um, posted. So, and this is another example of how um, these uh, imaginaries uh, 
visions and the apparent production of knowledge and mastery from that vision has been used to define the boundaries, not only between nature and non-nature, but also between the human and the animal. This is a quote from uh, Walton. Um, and we only would like to stress with this picture that uh, these imaginations, of course, get materialized. For example, uh, as you see here, uh, as fences, but also as what we can, uh, uh, what we call the big five, uh, this assemble of animals um, that that needs uh, to be present uh, if uh, um, tourists uh, shall be attracted. Uh, but also of wildlife sanctuaries, the imagination of uh, um, harmonic uh, wildlife, uh, for example. Um, of course, a wildlife that is uh, uh, employed for humans, not for itself, as uh, in the matrix, um, flagship species, and so on. But on the other hand, such materializations, of course, are are also contested in a material way, as you see here. Uh, so the fences are trespassed, boundaries are ignored, and territories invaded. And this is uh, what is uh, often called then human wildlife conflict. Uh, if, the, uh, he, if the wildlife does not uh, behave as it is uh, supposed to do, um, and as it is imagined uh, to do. It was so nice to listen to you. Yeah, so these are some of our um, foci inspired by John Uri, um, who started with this tourist gaze as one of the major aspects production of, of production of certain scapes, uh, tourist scapes, be it in urban areas or, or otherwise. And here, of course, and we emphasized at the beginning, there are <laughs> blatant economic interests at stake, um, um, trying to to attract and to reproduce, to um, get hold of this tourist gaze or even consumers' gaze. And when you are talking about the hunters who are coming for consumption, um, and here there are then uh, <laughs> implications on what kind of species are um, bred, what kind of species are presented in the parks, what are what are the species, species present in these parks? <coughs> um, then, of course, there are also uh, and still the science gaze. And if you are working in, in the Etosha Park, there are a whole range of zoologists and biologists who are working there and, and trying to understand, first, of course, the, the habitat and the ec ecological um, system there. And they are, of course, emphasizing the importance of the biodiversity, um, different um, um, rare species, um, and the de debate between the um, local, the endemic species, and the uh, neozoan or the invasive species. Then in these imaginations, there are also um, some romantic gaze, and I think here we, we saw already some some examples of it. And I think we, when we are traveling, um, we are looking for this pristine uh, nature, the, the sublime nature. <clears throat> and of course, this is nature without humans. And, and that's one reason why, for example, in the Tosha, um, uh, some of the sun people were expelled in order to make a proper natural park. Um, and then, of course, there are also some statutory gaze um, in the sense that some animals have a certain status, a national status, but also international status. I mean, we can't do, uh, and the Ministry of Environment uh, can't do whatever it wishes. Uh, it has also to respect some, some protocols of IUCN, etc. Um, <clears throat> some species are more protected than the others, which is also, of course, influencing the prioritization of um, the wildlife produced in certain areas. And this is also object of, of negotiations and power relationships um, inside the ministry, but also from the ministry on a global scale. What kind of, what, do, what can we do, what shall we do with the ivory, for example, etc.
Yeah, and this is perhaps what I already hinted at. Inside the Ministry of Environment and Tourism, there are some struggles uh, between different services departments. Um, <coughs> there are, of course, also struggles inside conservancies, be it freehold, perhaps e easier to solve, but also, and especially in communal conservancies, where some of the population are more in, in favor of certain species or certain approaches to wildlife management. The parliament, um, parliamentary debates on, for example, the shooting of the lions were also exemplary that there are different um, visions, different imaginaries here um, at play, how to deal with the so-called human wildlife um, conflicts. <coughs> and, and literally, these imagination, imaginations or imaginaries are now not linked to skin color and are not linked to certain ethnic groups. Um, and here in the ministry, we found um, in the hierarchy people with very different imaginaries or visions of um, nature conservation. And you can't make a correlation between these imaginations um, with skin color. And I think black people have now also completely um, internalized some um, white visions of wildlife and some of the white rangers or park managers have completely uh, distant visions of what w was inherited or what d d they did um, learn when they were at the university during the apartheid um, time. So it's, it's much um, complex about you now who is standing or what, what kind of representations do people have. Okay, we are thinking about putting a focus on um, the freehold conservancies because of different reasons. But one of, of them is that, um, as this quote from Jones and, and Barnes um, is, is showing, that um, the, the biggest increase of wildlife happened in these freehold conservancies, <coughs> especially uh, for large mammals. And um, here, according to this study, 80% of the numbers of larger game mammals are found in, on privately owned commercial farms. <coughs> and only 20% remains in either national parks or in the communal um, conservancies. And then we can finish. Um, just, um another remark. Uh, and another reason uh, for, for choosing this is also because we think that all these different gazes that Olivier has laid out uh, before, that they are coming together in a very particular way um, and a very exemplary way uh, in these uh, freehold conservancies. Um, for example, um, because of uh, the, the, uh, the tourist realm uh, that is very much um, um, important in this respect. Uh -huh. Yes, and uh, um, to finish with, uh, we have some questions. That's something I learned from Hans-Georg Bohle, who is also very well known in uh, this place. Um, it is better to finish with uh, good questions uh, than with good answers. <coughs> so these are a couple of our research questions uh, that we are going uh, to employ. So what kind of wildlife is produced? And I think if we have a historical glance, we can see how shifts were undertaken s since colonial times and how wildlife did change um, with, um, with colonialism, with apartheid, and now with um, um, the post-colonial era. And this means in, in terms of wildlife, in terms of animals present, um, um, in these parks, but also the imaginations and the visual mat materials which were produced. And you can easily compare what was taken from photographs or paintings from the, from the colonial times and compare them uh, with the, the images, the visuality produced today. A reconstruction with, which will be um, um, uh, connected to some archive work also on, these, uh, on the history of the images and uh, um, on the lines of uh, development of certain uh, images that we aim to reconstruct. Um, 
And then what we said before, uh, in particular, how do mental and material images of animals affect conservation approaches? Um, in what way are they prioritizing uh, certain species, uh, um, but others, uh, what is the effect on breeding, um, but also um, um, uh, what is the effect on, on uh, wildlife and management practices uh, that we can trace. And here, especially, I <coughs> The emphasis is also put on fences and, the, and the, the importance, the dominance of fences in Namibia. And I think this is a typical heritage of, of the apartheid period to solve conflicts by putting a fence uh, and to think that by putting a fence we will solve the, the, the conflict. That now with a fence everybody or now everything has its right place and as soon as you are losing now or, or, or leaving your right place then we have a problem. I think this is something which needs also uh, still to be excavated, the importance of the, the, the fence in these imaginations. The manner of uh, putting um, groups, not only of uh, people, but also animals into their place um, with the border in between. But then also, um, as we have mentioned, uh, we ask for uh, what uh, does the wildlife do? How, do, how does uh, the wildlife adapt, react, or even act uh, in terms of agency? Um, what do predators, elephants, and others do with uh, the borders that are given to them? And how, uh, in turn, does this uh, affect um, their constru construction? of the Namibian wildlife and the conservancies. Mm -hmm. Yes? <laughs> Mine. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> finally, <laughs> um, not finally, because there's more to come, of course. Um, what are the imaginations of relevant experts, of course, or the actors on the one hand, locally involved actors on the other, such as farmers, pastoralists, and so on, but as well as children. So, and uh, this is another strand that we would like to follow because uh, this stresses uh, the uh, idea that uh, the future of uh, Namibia's wildlife it's uh, not only in the hands of uh, present uh, um, uh, adult actors, but the future is made by these actors that are now young, that are now are being educated in schools uh, and have also have their particular imagination of wildlife, an imagination that is very much shaped also via the education process. So, these are um, some results of uh, interviews uh, that I was conducting in uh, Namibian schools. Um, together with this uh, picture, uh, on, for example, uh, as, as one question, uh, the question of, uh, do you think big cats should be protected? Why not? Another question is, was, uh, what uh, does these, uh, uh, what do these uh, this uh, big cats uh, uh, tell you about your life. What do they have to do with your life? Yeah, and here are some of the answers why they should be protected. Yes, because they are special and beautiful. So a very particular image of, uh, that will be maybe uh, very important for future conservation practices. Um, another girl said or wrote, um, it is really sad um, it is, really, uh, it is really saddening to think that the next generation will not be able to see these amazing animals, amazing animals. And uh, this imagination, of course, also has its history, you can um, propose. So, now we're at an end, and we thank you very much for the attention. And, uh,